considering uh, that we taught on the subject of sin and it was so popular, I thought today that we would talk about death. <laughs> Most of you are familiar with the, uh, the saying, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. Amen? Before we dig into <clears throat> the, uh, the teaching, a continuation of the study from Romans 6, uh, I want to read the chapter again, now from the New King James. We've taken some time in recent services reading this passage from a number of different translations. Let's start this morning from the New King James. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one's slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to lawlessness, to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We've been talking here from Romans, having entitled the message, No Reckon, Yield, and obey. <clears throat> uh, the apostle brings out the need to know 
who we are, what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, uh, where we stood prior to this glorious work of redemption that God effected altogether apart from us and then offers it to us. <clears throat> we are to know these things. And then we are to reckon that they are so. We are to consider, we are to account that these things are so, that not only has Jesus died, but we died with him. And not only has Jesus risen, but we rose with him. And we have risen to newness of life, having been set free from sin's power. If these things are true, as we say, in principle, then they ought to be true also in practice. Amen? If it's true that sin's power has been over us has been broken, then we should draw on the grace of God by faith that sin wouldn't in practice have dominion over us any longer. That's the way we used to live. We were powerless against the enemy. We were powerless to resist sin's draw, its pull. If we were to have said no to one sin, we, have, we would have prided ourselves in how good we were doing. Sin was ever there, wasn't it? But now we've been set free from sin's dominion and we've been <clears throat> uh, raised in the likeness of his resurrection so that we can walk in newness of life, now yielding our bodies, our members, unto God, unto righteousness, unto everlasting life. Amen? Amen. So I said we wanted to <clears throat> talk about sin, excuse me, about death today. Having talked to some about sin, I want to talk about death today. And I meant it. We're going to go back right over to Genesis. Turn with me to chapter 2. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2. And we'll read from verse 15 of Genesis 2. 15, 16, and 17. Scripture reads, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest, eat, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In the day that you eat thereof, you'll surely die. That's the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. And surely, as we well know and experience every day, death passed to all men, didn't it? They died. Now, <clears throat> we, we wanted talk some about what death really is because we would look at this and uh, our, our most common understanding of death uh, isn't borne out in the scripture as we see Eve take a bite of that fruit in the next chapter, is it? When we think of, of somebody dying, we think of uh, heart stopping, no more breath, no more brain waves. I mean, you can get technical if you want to. Maybe we're going to be brain dead or something like that, but when it all shuts down, we say that that body, that person is dead. But we well know from the narrative here in these early chapters of Genesis that when Eve partook and Adam partook, they didn't just drop dead immediately, did they? And so we've come to, to think of death in biblical terms. Uh, commonly, we talk of a separation or an alienation from God, don't we? Right? Not a, certainly not a cessation of existence and certainly not just a physical death, right? But we think in terms of, of death being a separation from God. What took place immediately? They saw that they were naked, they were ashamed, they ran and hid, they were fearful, weren't they? What's working there? Say it with me. Death. death. That's correct. Death is working there. Uh, it's not at all unbiblical to, to consider that the unsaved soul is walking in death. You with me there? Your body, still subject to decay, is under the influence of death that entered the human race in, this, in the garden here. 
death. Death passed all men from Romans 5. We'll probably get over there. But this death here is, is seen, must be understood as a violation of the commandment of God resulting in an alienation from God who is the source of life. The source of life. In him we, we live and move and have our being. And when, when that relationship is broken, death enters. Death enters. An alienation from God. I, you know, mentioned the born once, what? Die twice. The first death is this death that takes place that first came to humanity, all mankind, in the garden. That's the first death. That is the only one that anybody in the hearing of this should take, place, take, take part of. Don't have to go on from there and take part of the second death. But there is a second death that awaits those who have rejected the author of the second birth. You reject the offer of newness of life, redemption through his blood, and you await the second death. Damnation forever and ever. This is a death and you look at the world and we consider them the mess. I mean, you know, on one hand, we can say it's a lovely world. You know, the, the sun shines and the flowers bloom and the, the, the breeze feels pleasant, you know, in our faces. And it's a, a glorious creation that God has made. But it's a sin-cursed world, isn't it? Sure it is. Is there anybody here today that isn't experiencing some form of physical malady? Hmm? That's death working in us. That's death. Isn't that something? Every soul here, everybody, you know, you're just a regular, bunch of regular people. You're not hooked up to a whole bunch of tubes and in some IC unit, are you? But there's some pain, there's some stiffness, there's an ache, there's some, you know, there's some whatever. How about just aging? I see you all. <laughs> you're not as... Beautiful. Not all of you as beautiful as you used to be. Now, there's one person in here that's the exception to that. <laughs> Who grows more beautiful every day. <clears throat> but that is all death working. Death working. So yeah, whether it be disease, or aging, or famine, or things like hatred, and greed, and envy, and jealousy, that is all death working in the human race. That's what took place when God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You will pass from this relationship that you have had with me where you partook of nothing but life and, and fullness of life. And you'll reap the consequences, the wages of rebellion and being alienated from the very source of life. And so, yeah, there's, there's betrayal and there's heartache, and there's calamity, and there's sorrow. Thankfully, there awaits us a time when what? God will wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there will be no more pain. And there will be no more sorrow. And there will be no more suffering. That's what you look forward to, having given your life to Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've made a commitment of your life to Jesus, then that's one of the things you look forward to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When corruption will take on incorruption and mortality takes on immortality and death is swallowed up in life. That's what we look forward to. Well, <clears throat> in the day that, they, that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. It's the Romans 5 verse 12 passage that I've made reference to <clears throat> already. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world... And death through sin. And so death spread to all men. Because all sinned. Death that started, that entered the human race in the person of Eve and Adam. <clears throat> we give credit where credit's due. <clears throat> death spread to all men. <clears throat> all have sinned. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam, what's it say? All die. In Adam, all die. Death. What you experience now in, 
in experiencing periodically sickness or, or pain, sorrow, suffering, heartache, fear. That got passed along to us all through our father, Adam. As in Adam, all die. Of course, that verse goes on. The 1 Corinthians 15, 22 goes on and says, so in Christ, all will be made alive. If you're in Christ, you're made alive again. And the newness of life that you have is better than the life that Adam had and that Eve had. That's good news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's look at a few more passages where this truth is dealt with. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, one that we looked at the other evening. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. <clears throat> so we were born in sin and we sinned. And there was a record against us. And we walked in death, alienated from God, the very source of life. We were, <clears throat> we were already condemned. We were on death row, just awaiting. <clears throat> you know, the, the, <clears throat> the incarcerated individual has been <clears throat> convicted of a, a, a capital crime and is awaiting death. They're, they've been sentenced to death. Uh, there, too, that's only, that's only the first death that they die isn't it? We talk of death working in us. You know, people getting older, uh, experiencing disease, pain, sorrow. That's not the, the, the culmination of the, the, all that there is to death. The, the, the culmination of death for the mortal is when we do stop breathing, right? So there's always all this pain and sorrow and suffering physically that we've got to deal with all the the heartache uh, the trouble the turmoil emotionally mentally that we've got to deal with that's all death and then we we finally die right and there's relief far from it no then there's the fire of hell torment that lasts until a second judgment and then we're thrown into the 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 unrepentant sinner is what? Then thrown into the lake of hell and death, they thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever. So all you've got to deal with right now as a believer is putting up with a little bit of difficulty, heartache, maybe some trials, of, and, and I don't mean to minimize them, okay? Jesus is a mighty deliverer. If you're here today dealing with sickness in your body, Jesus, I want you to know, is the Lord our healer. Amen? The same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not saying you have to live with that. But you might experience that in this life, and most do, don't they? With me there? And you might deal with a great deal of uh, anxiety, but you don't have to. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Teaches us to cast all care unto him because he cares for us. Amen? But in this world, there will be tribulation. There will be trials, and one day soon, that's going to be gone for the believer. But for the unbeliever, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you remember the old bumper sticker? I, I, <clears throat> I've mentioned it before. It was one that was around for a while. You'd see it from time to time, and it read, uh, Life is hard, then you die. And I'm not sure just where they were going with that. <clears throat> uh, if they, if that's, that's, you know, life is hard, and then you die, what a bummer. Oh. Boy, they have, li they have no idea how bad it gets at that point. Because frankly, in this life, in this life, there is at least momentary relief uh, that, that can be enjoyed. You know, uh, I like the way it's put over there in Hebrews 11 where, where Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than do what? Enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And there are some earthly, natural, physical pleasures that can be enjoyed in the midst of this, uh, <clears throat> this death that we're having to contend with. But not so in hell. Not so in hell. 
Not after you breathe your last. Then you go to hell, and then you await the second judgment, the final judgment. And I'm, I, I'm talking there to <clears throat> the non-believer, the non-believer then. You, if you're a believer here today, in the midst of the tribulation, you know the joy of his presence. You have the opportunity to, by faith, draw on grace, peace, strength, uh, healing. Amen? And know that God provides all that you have need of according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We've got to insert that from time to time because we are talking about death today, aren't we? <laughs> God remind everybody how good it is to be a Christian. Here and in the life to come. Amen? But death is serious business. Death is real serious business. But the believer isn't afraid of breathing their last. The believer knows that <clears throat> the only death that, that awaits them is a death of this mortal where you, where you then are, are translated into the presence of God Almighty, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen? That's what we're looking forward to. And we don't get too caught up with the here and now. It is difficult. And for some, we'd say, man, they've got a, a, a lot tougher lot in life than, than I do. And, and, and you don't have to look far to find somebody that's got worth, worse than you. And I hope that we've all come to realize that. Because sometimes we can get preoccupied with our own sorrows and woes. And you don't have to look very far at all. Amen? <clears throat> Look at me, do. <clears throat> Did we read Colossians 2 yet? Verse 13 and 14. You being dead in your sins and in the un uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven <clears throat> all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, took him out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. <clears throat> a reference to the second death. As Jesus <clears throat> speaks to John regarding the seven churches of Asia Minor. Just look with me down to verse 11. We'll jump right in there. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The second death. So there's a first death that uh, goes all the way from Eve through the human race up until the time of <clears throat> the end of the age when there is a final judgment and then there is the second death. And that's the one that you really don't want to partake of. If at this time you choose <clears throat> to accept the offer of forgiveness of sins and newness of life, then you don't have to experience that second death, do you? <clears throat> Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we want to talk a little bit about death and Jesus dying on our behalf. I've told you before, that last song that we sang, sometimes I have a hard time singing it all the way through that. I, um, I get pretty choked up. <clears throat> Difficult to, to, to sing of um, the, uh, <clears throat> in my sin, even then, he shed his blood for me. That's a hard line for me to sing, just to consider the sacrifice that Jesus, Jesus has made when we were, we were rebels, so hopelessly lost, without hope and without God in this world. We, were, we did not seek him. He sought us out. And in his mercy enabled us to hear his voice. Amen? <clears throat> but here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, a very familiar verse because the, of the preciousness of the truths brought out. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We shift gears a little bit and we talk about now the our sin being put upon Jesus, bringing about his death. And maybe we'll, <clears throat> as we wade into this portion, uh, 
let's talk a little bit. You know how there are a number of, of figures that are used in the scripture that would uh, uh, speak of, of death. Here in the Romans chapter 6 passage that we've been working out of, uh, we've spoken of, of sin and its bondage and the, and the consequent death, the alienation from God. <clears throat> we, we speak of um, slavery too, don't we? Don't we? Those figures are used in that one chapter, aren't they? Death and, and being enslaved to sin, which is, which is death working, isn't it? Um, one of the ways in which uh, <clears throat> I find it helpful, using biblical terms, and I don't, whenever um, I, uh, I would share with you uh, <clears throat> an analogy, I'm mindful that there are a number of analogies that are given to us or, or pictures that are given to us in the scripture. And I wouldn't want to in any way mislead anybody and teach it as pure doctrine. But uh, certainly the scripture speaks of bondage, doesn't it? Uh, it speaks of being enslaved. Uh, the, the, we, it speaks of, um, of, of the, captive, the captivity, doesn't it? That's all language of the scripture. So it is biblical for us to understand that we were enslaved or held captive by sin and by the devil. And that is just due for rebellion. You with me there? Sometimes we think of somebody being held captive or, um, and, and, and they're, they're innocent. We were held captive, but we were not innocent. You with me there? So try to pull together some of these uh, pictures that are given to us from the, the Bible. We're, we're in bondage, we're enslaved, we're chained, but we were so because of our sin, right? Justly, rightly. We were, yeah, we were, in, we were locked up in, in prison, but we were not innocent locked up in prison. We were guilty. We had been condemned. The Bible says we were condemned because we had not believed, right? The, the sentence that was against us was a just sentence. The Bible says that the soul sins shall die. And we sinned. And in our sinful, rebellious state, we were like locked up. Enslaved, bound, chained, totally powerless to rescue ourselves. Um, you know, you can take it out there a little bit and, you know, maybe uh, you're locked up in prison and you try to do good. You try to do good to the person next to you in your cell or the next cell over. You're nice to the guard. No, 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 no. None of that good is going to get you out of there because you deserve the death penalty. Right? And sometimes that takes a little bit. Death penalty? Man, I've done some bad things, but not the death penalty Adjust the way you think about the seriousness of sin. Adjust it to line up with what the Bible has to say about the seriousness of sin. The soul, the, the soul that sins shall die. It doesn't say the soul that commits murder. How about lying or envy or jealousy? That's all sin. And the wages of sin is death. And so when we're condemned to death in our enslaved, incarcerated, chained up, locked up, tortured condition, we deserve it and are totally powerless to get ourselves out of there. Can't, can't break out, can't do any good to merit a, 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 a conversion or a commutation of the sentence, can we? No. No. So in that condition, Jesus comes, doesn't he? He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus comes to meet us in that place. I, bear with me. He comes into the jail where I'm locked up and I've been beaten and I've just been, I've just been tortured and beaten, chained and miserably treated. And, and, and I deserve it. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, get you to feel sorry for me. I deserve every bit of that and more. But Jesus comes to me and meets me there. And he offers me what? A rescue. You had enough of being in bondage to your own sin, your own lusts? Hmm? I offer to you a rescue. Newness, a brand new life, better than you could ever imagine. Infinitely better. But it comes with conditions. I will be your Lord. But I'm a good Lord. 
I love you, take good care of you. You'll know joy uh, unimaginable in my presence. So I could sit there and I could think, what? Uh, no, I don't want to have Jesus as my Lord. I want to be my own Lord, even if it means staying in prison forever. And sadly, that's what the unrepentant do. The, 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 the people who, do, who reject Jesus' lordship do, do so just right there. You do understand that, don't you? Jesus meets us in our death, in our death. And he takes us into himself. I don't know, maybe he sticks us in his pocket, <laughs> absorbs us into himself. But in, in a way that is infinitely beyond our capacity to understand, he then bears the punishment for our sin, doesn't he? A million times a billion, billion, billion souls burning forever in hell does not fully satisfy the justice of God. But Jesus' death does. Jesus' death does. He was made to be sin for us who, who knew no sin. Only, only Jesus could suffer the just for the unjust that we might brought, be brought to God. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. Look at me over to Isaiah 53. The suffering servant, amen? Unimaginably, Jesus is... <clears throat> Jesus suffers, <clears throat> is punished for the sins of all humanity. Death. He is delivered unto death. I read from verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I want you to see what Jesus bore on our behalf here. He bore death. He bore the death penalty. A penalty that would have been served through eternity by us. And again, never fully satisfying the righteous requirements of God's justice. But Jesus was able to die and meet those requirements. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of all the human race. Were we to be able to begin to imagine all the, the evil acts, evil deeds, all the evil desires and all the evil thoughts that have been committed by all mankind since Adam and Eve. The Lord put on Jesus. These are things that are so beyond our ability to fathom. We've got to take the biblical record. Amen? The Bible says, <clears throat> the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he is cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Thank you, Jesus. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Now look at verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. How about that? The righteous requirements of a death sentence are satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. The death penalty is borne by Jesus. He is the, the just suffering for the unjust that he might bring us to God. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus has borne the penalty <clears throat> in himself on our behalf. In the, the realm of the unseen, these things have taken place. Before we were, these things have taken place. He's the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. The lamb that was slain <clears throat> to take away the sin of the world. Jesus died with our death. Oh, and, and <clears throat> you know, there have been, uh, there's been much debate over the years, you know, about uh, what it means for Jesus to die and he's on the cross and he says, my God, my God, you know, why hast thou forsaken me? And did Jesus die spiritually? We're not here to talk about, about those things. We will stay close to what the scripture <clears throat> says when it says that the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He's satisfied. That the death penalty that was upon the human race has been paid. The penalty has been paid in full. And so Jesus on the cross says what? It is finished. Paid in full. And we rejoice in that, don't we? Here today as believers, we, re we rejoice in what Jesus has accomplished <clears throat> on our behalf. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus came to deal with the, the sin problem and its consequences. Galatians chapter 3, Christ has redeemed us, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. <clears throat> And 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus <clears throat> is the sin bearer. Jesus is the one who died with our death. He came and yes, in that, <clears throat> that state that we were in, he met us. We've been talking there from the first few verses of Romans 6. Buried by baptism and to death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's it say? God forbid. How should he that is dead to sin live any longer therein? And what's being discussed there is the, the death to sin that took place, the death to sin that took place as you took on a new life. We were dead, alienated from God by our rebellion, and we inherited from Adam, and Jesus met us in our dead condition. And he... <clears throat> oh, how about the apostle saying, I am what? Crucified with... I'm crucified. And we say, well, I was never crucified. A believer says, I was crucified with Christ. Not by my choice, uh, so much as it was by his doing. Amen? Amen. He took me into himself. He joined me to himself. He took me with him. And he then was crucified. He met me. He met you in your dead condition. And yes, he was, you were crucified with Christ. And now, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, you die no more. Amen? Death has no more and sin has no more dominion over you. Does it? <clears throat> If we have been united with him in a death like his, Romans 6, verse 5, 
we shall certainly be united with him in, the resurre in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Crucified with him. This is a, a crucifixion that takes place. <clears throat> we don't think of ourselves as being crucified with him. We need to. We need to understand that that is exactly what the apostle says that we should know. We were crucified with Jesus. We died with him. He died. We might say he died with us. He even met us in our lost condition. And he bore the death penalty. We, the death penalty was placed upon him, wasn't it? He took our sin upon himself. He bore our sin in his body on the tree. And he was buried. But because he was the just suffering for the unjust, death could not hold him, could it? Death could hold you because you were guilty. Death could keep me down because I was a transgressor. I could stand before God Almighty and say, I could plead for mercy, but I'm guilty. I'm guilty. The judge says, okay, I hear you pleading for mercy, but you, you're guilty. But not so with Jesus. The devil can bring an accusation against Jesus, but it doesn't hold, doesn't stick. He's the Lamb of God, pure, spotless, sinless. Lamb of God. And so death has no power to keep him down, does it? So when he, when we're buried, when he was buried, we were buried with him. Buried by baptism into death. Amen? that he might be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So that when he rises, again, we rise with him, don't we? We rise with him. Raised in newness of life. This is the, the good news. This is the good news. We're talking about death today. Yeah. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's good news. Amen? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's good news. He bore fully the punishment that we, all humanity, all the whole human race, through the ages, he bore it all in himself, in his body, on the tree. And the Lord has been satisfied with that sacrifice. And if the penalty has been paid in full, then whosoever will may now partake of the benefits of that penalty having been paid. You know, we used a little example the other day of, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Right? <clears throat> and um, uh, President Lincoln signs into law, <clears throat> all the slaves are free. A slaveholder could tell the, the slave that, uh, no, you're not free. But the slave could stand up and say, yes, I am. Right? Because a greater one than you has said I am. Right? And in, a, in an analogous way, the enemy, who is the accuser of the brethren, comes to try to convince you that you're just the same old sinner that you always have been. There's not really practically, at least not in this life, uh, you know, a practical help to have, allow you to live free from your self-love. <laughs> we just package it all up right there, right? Self-love, selfishness. <clears throat> And he's called the father of lies, isn't he? Isn't he? Yeah. Because whom the son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. So who do you believe? Who do you believe today? Huh? Do you believe God's witness or the devil's? Do you believe that you have to live in bondage to, you know, to fear, to worry, to lust, to envy? To, huh? Or do you believe... God's witness that all the penalty of sin has been paid and now you have been raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Sin has no more dominion over you. Do you believe that witness? That's God's witness. These are things that we are to know and reckon and then we are to yield and obey. Amen? Yield and obey. Yield yourself as servants now to God. Obey from the heart that form of doctrine which has been delivered unto you. Amen? Jesus paid the death penalty in our behalf. <clears throat> and we as his people have been set free now to serve 
the living and true God. Let's finish there for this morning. Heavenly Father, we do so thank you and praise you. We rejoice in your goodness. We bless your holy name, O Lord God. Thank you, O Lord, that you, Lord God, you sent your only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus, the just one, suffering for the unjust to bring us to God, put to death in the flesh, quickened by the Spirit. We thank you, O Lord God, that we can now reckon to our account that we have been crucified with Christ. That we have been buried by baptism into death. That we are raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That sin has no more dominion over us. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We do bless and praise your wonderful name and, and trust you for the grace to apply these truths to our lives practically to honor you with our all, O oh Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.